Well, welcome to City Church. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the, the pastors here and excited to get to talk to you guys as we finish up this series we're in called um, El Nombre. And I realize I say that super white, but that's all I've got. Okay, so we're just have to go with it. Um, the first week, Clayton talked about Elohim. We're talking about the names of God here, right? Like if we knew more about God and how the Bible refers to him, all the different names of God, we can know how to relate to him in a deeper way. We can uh, learn more about his character. He talked about Elohim. God is the, the creator of everything that he existed even from the beginning in communion in, in the Trinity and that he's the God above every other God. And then last week he talked about El Roy. Um, that's not El Roy. That's your redneck neighbor. This is El Roy, the God who sees me. And uh, this week I'm going to be talking about this Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. Paul in Hebrews 13 says it like this. Uh, he calls God uh, the great shepherd of the sheep. So God, we're going to be kind of trying to relate to him tonight as the shepherd. So obviously, obviously if God is the shepherd, then we are the sheep. And uh, that got me to thinking, like, could there be a worse animal to be compared to? You know, it's like, why can't we be compared to something a little more awesome? You know, like at least like a ram, that's better, right? Or maybe a bull or a grizzly bear is pretty cool, a lion even, right? Or a falcon. Uh, I realize it's not a falcon, it's an owl, okay? But that picture was too good to pass up. She's owning it. Um, but then it occurred to me, you know, it could always be worse, right? We could be compared to what your husband normally acts like, right? So all things considered, sheep aren't so bad. But I had to do some research about shepherds and about sheep. And so I thought I'd kind of loosen us up tonight with some uh, sheep facts, okay? <laughs> You're going to learn more than you ever wanted to know about sheep tonight. Uh, first of all, sheep and shepherds, it's mentioned 247 times in the Bible. That's a lot of times. Uh, there's a, a billion sheep in the world today, over 900 different breeds of sheep. Uh, sheep, believe it or not, can have best friends. Like, I don't know what kind of survey they did to figure that out, but... They have an incredibly long memory, up to 50. They can mem memorize up to 50 human faces. They can even read expressions off of our faces. That's kind of cool. Um, they get sheared usually once a year. And in that year, they can grow up to eight pounds of wool. And that wool can be uh, strung together in a, in a thread that's over 125 miles long. Because of all that wool, though, like water is not their friend. Like if they get into a deep lake, they're going to drown because the, the wool absorbs the water and they sink. It's kind of sad. Um, there's lots of ways they know how to die, actually, we'll find out. Um, they have bad eyesight, but excellent hearing. The sound a female sheep makes is called bleating, and her offspring can identify her by the sound that she makes. Um, sheep, this is, this is another sad fact, they, they can't right themselves out of certain positions. Like if they get tipped over or they fall or something and they end up on their back, they can't get up. Uh, they eventually die. That's, that's a true story. Uh, it's like I, I've fallen, I can't get up kind of thing. Um, if you see a sheep on its back, help it out. Um, sheep are made, uh, they, they're used to make tennis rackets, the string in tennis rackets. What do you think they could possibly use to make the string on a tennis racket? It takes the small intestines of 11 sheep to make one tennis racket, right? See, tennis is evil. You should stay away from it. This is my favorite one. A castrated male sheep is called a weather. I guess like whether or not it's a boy or girl, it doesn't really matter now, right? <laughs> so sheep, sheep aren't that good at a lot of things. Uh, they're good at hearing. Um, they're also good at drowning. Uh, they're good at being defenseless and they're good at being utterly dependent on the shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd to stay alive. So as we're looking at God as the good shepherd and, and we as his flock, how can we relate to God in this way as a shepherd? Like what does he do for us as the shepherd? So first of all, the Lord our shepherd protects us, protects us. See, sheep, like we've said, they're kind of stupid. Uh, they, they, they need protecting. They tend to wander from the flock, right? They get too far away. And they need some help 
from time to time. They're very vulnerable, right? If they, if they get attacked by a predator of any kind, there, there's literally nothing they can do. They can't outrun it. They can't fight back. And, and I've read they, they're actually highly emotional. Like they freak out. They panic. They can even have heart attacks. Um, again, I don't know how they know that. Uh, the autopsy, I guess. Um, I, I don't know how that works. But they're completely def- defenseless in every single way. So the sheep need a shepherd to protect them. So if God is our great shepherd, how does he protect us? We're going to look at a real practical way, first of all. He protects us by telling us how to keep us from hurting ourselves. Well, you're like, well, why do we need that? Well, because we're like sheep, right? Sometimes we're dumb. Uh, if, if you think about it, you know, we go through a lot of things in life. Sometimes they're difficult things. But if we're being honest, a lot of the things we go through are just the, the consequences of our own stupid mistakes. I mean, think about it. We make mistakes, we pay the consequences. We sometimes pay for them for a long time. But see, God is our good, good father. And like any good father, he wants to protect us from getting hurt. Now, so, somehow we've kind of dumbed Christianity down. We do this without even thinking about it. We dumb it down to just being kind of a list of rules, right? Well, if I'm a Christian, I can't do this list of things that I really want to do. And I have to do all these other things that I don't really feel like doing. But really, God gives us guardrails for our lives to keep us from crashing. Like, he doesn't want, he doesn't want to see us get hurt. Like, you know, for you parents that have kids, you know this. Like, kids aren't born just automatically knowing everything there is to know about not getting hurt, right? It seems to me like most kids, like, they're trying to invent new ways every day of getting hurt. Uh, I know that's, tr- that's true for mine. And so we have to give them rules, right? He gives us guardrails. Like, I was going to, to Dallas last week, and there was... Um, some construction going on. And there was a sign that said, caution, guardrail damage ahead. Like not only is, was there guardrails on this overpass, but because it was damaged, uh, they had to tell us like, be careful because that guardrail is damaged. It's missing in this one spot. And we don't want you to go off of it and and crash. Have you ever been on like a, a windy mountain road where there's no guardrails? It's terrifying, right? I mean, uh, uh, I spent some time with our mission partner in, in Chiapas, uh, Greg McClanahan, <laughs> in a couple different trips there. And, and his mission center is up in the, the mountains, way like literally above the cloud line um, in San Cristobal. And at the bottom of the mountain is the capital city, Tuxla, right? And you have to go between the two. And they've built this new kind of toll road uh, that's not as wide as it should be. <laughs> uh, but it gets you up the mountain fast, right? It's a pretty nice road. But sometimes the road's closed for construction, or sometimes there's militant groups that take over the, the toll booths and don't let people through. And that happened to us one time, so we had to take the old road. Okay, the old road is, is like this tiny, gravelly, like it's not even two lanes. It's just like this little path up this mountain. Literally takes you like an hour and a half to get up it. And we're in, packed into this 15-passenger van. Like, and you're, look out the window, and you can't even see the edge of the road, right? It's just like... There's the town way down there, you know, and he's telling us fun stories like, hey, you see all those crosses on the side of the road right there? That's where the bus went over and everyone died. And we're like, oh, my gosh, get me out of here, you know, like guardrails are are super important. It's no different with our lives. God's given us in his word guardrails to keep us from getting hurt. Why? Because he loves us. We tell our kids, look both ways before you cross the street. You know, don't touch the stove. It's going to burn you. And actually, one of my earliest, this has to be one of my earliest memories. I was probably about four because I remember being kind of like eye level to the countertop in the bathroom, right? And I had been told, don't touch the curling iron. Um, I, I grew up with two older sisters, and we shared a bathroom, so there's a lot of stuff in there I didn't understand. But the curling iron <laughs> was there, and I had been told not to touch it. And I was like, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch it, right? i got to find out for myself. And I didn't just touch it. I grabbed it with my whole hand. And for some reason, I kind of held it there for a second. You know that, that thing where I think it's one of those things where it's so hot, you can't tell it's hot yet, you know? It was one of those, man. And it just seared my hand. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. Don't share a bathroom with girls, okay, because <laughs> girls are gross, uh, except for my wife. She's awesome. Guys, God doesn't want us to get hurt. 
He's given us ways to protect us. I, I encourage you, if you haven't read your Bible in a while, man, download the Bible app. I don't care what you're going through, what you're struggling with, what you have questions about. It's all in there. You can, you can look up, uh, search for different reading plans. I don't care if it's about uh, money or marriage, relationships of any kind, addictions. It's all there for you. God wants to help us get through life. He wants to keep us from getting hurt. Uh, God also, he protects us by giving us peace in the midst of chaos. He gives us peace. Like our lives can be chaotic, right? Most of the time. And, and it's the same with the sheep. Sheep, I told you, they're highly emotional animals. They, they freak out. They can, they can tend to panic. But just the presence of the shepherd brings the sheep some calmness, some, some, some peace and serenity. It brings them comfort and security. See, our, our, our lives get out of control. We, we, we react emotionally to things. Sometimes we panic. Sometimes we freak out. But we don't always realize that, that the good shepherd is with us, right? He, and, and he's not even just with us. If you're a Christ follower, you, you have the spirit of God living inside of you. I mean, think about that for a second. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, like took someone that was dead and brought him back to life. That same spirit is, is inside of you right this second, like literally, not like figuratively, like literally inside of you. He's not just with you. He's not just ahead of you, beside you, behind you. He's, he's inside of you. So you would think having that knowledge, we should go through life a little bit differently, like a little more confidence, right? Like what, what, what in the world should we be afraid of? My favorite example of this in the Bible is with David. You remember King David before he was a king, he was a shepherd. And there's this story in the Bible about David and Goliath, right? And Goliath is out in this field, like taunting uh, Saul's army and like daring somebody to come fight him, right? And just insulting them and they're all scared. And David rolls up like little shepherd boy David and is like, I'll do it, you know? And Saul's like, there's no chance I'm letting you go out there, right? But David, this is his response. Check it out. David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Oh, well, that makes you qualified to be a, a, a giant slayer, right? But listen, he says, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. How awesome is that? And it wasn't just like he, he was so confident in his own strength and abilities. No, he was like, God is with me. God, he, he's done it before and he'll do it again because he's with me and he's faithful. See, we should walk through life with a little different level of confidence as, as believers, as Christians who have the spirit of God in us. I have a, a friend, his name is John Gomez. He doesn't know I'm gonna tell the story, but uh, John is a, re a retired detective from the, the police department. He's one of our security officers here and at, the, at Raider Church. And man, John's been through a lot of stuff. He's seen a lot. He's handled a lot of different situations. He's had a lot of different trainings. I mean, decades of experience handling things that would freak out most people, right? So when I'm with John, I have a little different level of confidence and just, just some security, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, John. Um, <laughs> there was one time John and I were in Walmart together, and there was, there was like, you know, of course, at Walmart, of course, there's going to be like a domestic disturbance happening right there at the registers. And there was this guy like screaming at this lady that was probably his wife or girlfriend or something, and it was getting to that point where like, somebody's going to have to do something, right? And I'm not normally a, a confrontational kind of person, but something about John being with me just made me a little more confident, right? Like John's going to handle it if something needs to be handled. Uh, no, nothing ended up happening, you know, uh, but, but that, that thought stuck with me, like, because why? He's been through stuff before. He knows how to de-escalate things, right? 
he, he knows how to handle it. Plus, he has a gun most of the time. So uh, <laughs> that helps too. Guys, God is in, in us. He's with us. And he wants to protect us. You aren't alone. So next, the good shepherd. He leads us. The good shepherd leads his sheep. See, sheep, they know the voice of their shepherd. And they follow him. They have a, a relationship that's built over time where they trust him. They're not going to follow anyone else. They're going to follow the shepherd. John chapter 10, this is Jesus talking. He said, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, speaking of the, the shepherd. And the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow him because why? They know his voice. So, sheep, do you know the voice of the shepherd? Do you know his voice? Do you know when, when he's talking to you? Do you recognize it? Does he even talk to you? See, I know the answer to that question. It's absolutely yes, he does. If you're a Christ follower, you have his spirit living on the side of you. He, he talks to you constantly. Did you know that? Do you, do you hear it? Do you recognize it? Like, how does that even work? Like, if I, if I have a thought pop in my head or some kind of idea or something, how do I know that's God talking to me and not just, like, me talking to me, Right? Or not just the Allsup's burrito that I ate, you know, <laughs> like going wrong on me. How, how do I know it's him? How does that work? Have you ever thought about that? And see, I, I think the sad thing is a lot of times, this is my experience, like preachers um, can tend to kind of over-romanticize God speaking to them to the point where it kind of leaves us disillusioned. You know what I'm talking about? Like sometimes certain people can make it sound like their interaction with God is this huge theatric event, right? And the, the clouds part and this beam of light shines down on them and God speaks to them in this thundering voice and they know every word that he says and he, you know, the punctuation and everything. And it's like they're reading a manuscript, you know, he gives them the manuscript later so they can check every word that he said. And you're like, you sit there and think, man, that guy must be awesome, right? You think, man, man, why doesn't God talk to me this way? What's wrong with me? Am I the only one that thinks that way? I think that way. And, and I'm not saying God doesn't speak to us audibly even. I've heard that happens to people. It's never happened to me. And I know some people hear from God a little more clearly and, and maybe even more often than other people. But God talks to all of us. There's nothing special about a preacher where God talks to him more than he talks to you. The question is, have you learned how to discern his voice and do you recognize it? Like my mom, I, I know her voice. Why? I've heard it my whole life, right? Like I can pick her, like she, she's gone to, to churches that I've ministered at pretty much all 20 years that I've been in ministry. And I don't care how big the crowd is, I know exactly where she's sitting because I can hear her. <laughs> Isn't that, not that she sings loud, but it's like there's a, there's a sound where she makes the, the S sound and, and it's very distinct to my ears because I, I can pick it. I don't care how loud the music is, I can pick it out because I know her. I have a relationship with her. I've, I've talked with her many, many times. So how do we do that in our own lives? How do, we, how do we pick out the voice of God over all the noise in our lives? Experiencing God is a, a devotional by Henry Blackaby. We, we've talked about it before, but he talks about a few different ways God speaks to us. And I think that we understand most of them. Like he speaks to us through his word. I think we get that, right? We read scripture. We can kind of tell God's leading us and telling us this based on what we're reading. He speaks through other people, right? You might have someone come and say, man, I feel like God wants me to tell you this. That's pretty easy to figure out. Our circumstances, we get that memo most of the time. Like things happen in our lives and you, you think maybe God's trying to say something to me here. But what about the Holy Spirit? That's, that's the last way he speaks to us, through, 
through his spirit that's on the inside of us. Most people ask, they'll, they'll ask me like, well, how do, how do you know that God's saying that to you? Like, how do you know God's leading you to do that? And my honest answer is, I'm not sure most of the time, at least at first. Let me give you an example of this. So I worked at uh, Experience Life, another church in town, for the last 10 years, and was one of the ones that helped start that church. And kind of the end of last year, I started feeling like, man, I'm just, I'm tired. That was a lot of, a lot of work that went into to, to, you know, doing that. And I kind of decided by January, man, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. I've got, I need to take a break. I need to get just a different pace to my life, spend some time with my family. So I quit. And I just wanted to, to take some time off for ministry. I didn't know for how long. Um, I was open to whatever, I guess, you know, I, I knew probably I would be back in ministry eventually, but I started doing remodels full-time, construction, and I loved it. It was just, it was good for my family. And people would ask me like, well, are you going to go to a different church? Are you going to lead worship somewhere? Are you going to start a new church? And like, my answer was always like, like the thought of starting something new, like makes you want to throw up, you know, because it's like, it's difficult work, you know, and, and I didn't want to do it. But then I kind of started having this nagging thing kind of going on where, man, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to do something. I don't know what. This is this little thought that popped in my head. See, some advice my mom gave me one time was, anytime you have a thought pop into your head that you wouldn't normally think, you might want to pay attention to it. Like that may be your first clue that God might be speaking to you. Now, it, it'll also line up with his character, right? Like he's not going to tell you to kill someone, right? Because that doesn't line up with his character. That's probably the burrito that you ate. You should not do that. But if you're like a thought, you have a clear thought and you're like, oh, that's weird. And it lines up with maybe the Bible or God's character or whatever, man, maybe you should pay attention to it. And so I did. And then she came to me, my mom, and she had a word for, she felt like God was, you know, leading her to tell me some things. And they kind of pointed in that direction, like me, you know, leading and casting vision and, and some different things. And that was kind of another, another building block. So, you know, I talked with my family and prayed and just waited and just, man, I don't know, is this, is this really from God? And then I had a dream that really freaked me out. I mean, it was so vivid and just mysterious kind of, and I just knew that it was from God and it made me ask some questions and it made me pray some more. And, and then Mark told me that Clayton was thinking about starting something new. And so I met with Clayton and we talked about things that were on our heart and what maybe God was leading us to do. And, and little by little by little, I got more and more and more sure that God was leading me. He was speaking to me to the point to where I, I was, I was positive, like, let's do this. But it didn't happen all at once. There wasn't a bush that caught on fire and just spoke to me, you know, it, it was little by little. And, and see, I think that's, how our lives as Christians, if we're going to be led by him, that's what they should look like. You know, maybe you hear a little something or you have a thought or something. You at least have to start with the question, God, is this from you? Right? And maybe you take a step and maybe you wait, maybe you pray, maybe you ask some people and you, you, you kind of get some confirmation and you take another step. And you wait and you pray and you get some confirmation and you take another step and you take another step and now you're walking in obedience. And little by little you learn to discern God's voice over everything else in your life. Little by little, your faith in him grows. Your relationship with him grows. He is speaking to you constantly. Why? Because he wants to lead you. To what? He has plans for you. Like, he, he has plans for you that will blow away anything that you could even possibly imagine. And he, he's whispering to you day by day, hey, come follow me. Come, come this way. You won't believe what I have for you. The word tells us that it's plans to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. You can't get there on your own. You have to listen for the voice of the shepherd. 
There's a, a song by Tyler Farr. He's a country music artist, and he has a song called um, I Should Go to Church Sometime. And in it, he talks about how he should go to church sometime. <laughs> and uh, he should dust off his Bible and read it, right? And start, start getting back in to church is what it's about. But there's a line that I love in the chorus. It says this. He goes, Lord knows I could use some light to get where I'm going. Guys, we need some light to get where we're going. We face so many decisions every single day. If you're a young person in the room, a student, oh, my gosh. You have so many things ahead of you, like life-altering decisions. Do you want to face those blindly? Like, do you just want to kind of walk blindly your own way and hope it works out okay? Or do you want to be led by the good shepherd? Parents, you need help raising your kids? You just want to try to do your best and see how it goes? Or do you want to be led by the good shepherd? who wants what's best for us. He's leading us. He's leading us. Lastly, he rescues us. He rescues us. See, the sheep have a tendency to leave the flock to wander off on their own. And sometimes the shepherd has to go after them. He has to go try to find them. Sometimes he even has to risk his life to save that sheep. You remember the story of David fighting off lions and tigers and bears, right? Why would they do that? You see, the sheep is the shepherd's livelihood. He cares a lot about those sheep. He knows each of them by name. He probably paid a really high price to get that sheep. And so... He's more than willing to risk his life to protect his flock. And Jesus did the same thing for us. Check it out. This is back to John 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money. He doesn't really care about the sheep, but I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I don't just risk my life for the sheep. He says, I sacrifice my life for the sheep. He sacrificed his life for us, the stupid sheep. Why would he do that? Maybe because we're his prized possession. We were definitely bought at a price. But see, it's it's a personal thing. Like, I know for me, you know, when it comes to the gospel, we start thinking, yeah, Jesus died for everyone. He died for all of mankind. He died to pay for our sins and to give us a way to be made right with God. But it's more, it's more personal than that. He didn't just die for everyone. Like, he died for you. He died for, for me. And it's not like he didn't know you, right? God's, God's eternal. He's, he's, he's timeless. He was there before everything. He's there now. He's going to be there later. He knows the end of the story. And at the foundation of the earth, at the beginning of time, he already knew you. He already knew your name. He already knew all of the mistakes that you would make. He already knew the junk that you're going to do uh, tomorrow and next year or whatever. He knew all the times you would turn your back on him. And he still chose to die for you. <laughs> How amazing is that? He, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's, he's eternal. He's all these things, but he still 
so very interested in every single individual. He delights in every detail of our lives. He's, he's concerned about that one. Matthew chapter 18. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. That's a good shepherd. Are you wandering? Can, can your life, spiritually speaking, can it be defined as just a series of choices you make to do your own thing, to go your own way? Are, are, you, are you wandering? Are you, are you running? Because the good shepherd is pursuing you. He's been pursuing you your entire life. He's chased you right here to this, this moment tonight. And he's, he's telling you, man, just, just turn around. Like you have no idea the plans that I have for your life. He wants to protect you. He wants to, to lead you and he wants to rescue you tonight. What are you gonna do? Man, sheep need a shepherd. And he loves you that much. Isaiah told, tells us that we're all like sheep. We've all wandered away and gone, done our own thing, kind of pursued our own path. Yet the Lord laid on him, on Jesus, the sins of all of us. He's never left you. You know, we, we leave his path and he still chooses to save us. That's grace. Grace is something we don't deserve is something we couldn't possibly earn and he still freely gives it i want to end with probably the most famous of all shepherd verses and that's psalm 23 and guess who wrote it david the shepherd david knew something about being a shepherd He knew something about being, he knew something about being a shepherd. He knew something about sheep and he knew God's heart. And I, I want to do something different. It's going to be up on the, the big screen. I want us to all read it together out loud. And I don't want you to read it like you're just reciting the words of David, right? No, I want you to read it like these are your words as you're coming to the realization of all the things that God does for you and just make it kind of your prayer to God, all of us together. Can we do that? All right, let's go. It says, um, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That kind of sums it up, doesn't it? He leads us, leads us into the pastures where we can eat and where we can rest and leads us even through dark valleys, like when, not if, when we go through those dark places, he's with us, he's got our back, he protects us. He's a good shepherd. So we're going to close. We're going to sing. I want to I invite you to be open to what God is saying to you. 
We get a warning in the book of Psalms too. He says, today, when you hear his voice, not if you hear his voice, today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Man, I've been there. Sometimes we, we've ignored him for so long, we don't hear it anymore. Our hearts have become hard. Some of us need to, to just ask God, God, open my eyes to you. Open my ears. Soften my heart. I want to hear you again. I want to be led by the good shepherd. And I'm going to kind of pray this scripture over us as we go. And I can't wait to see what God does in our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, you are our shepherd, the great shepherd. What else could we need? Thank you for letting us rest in green meadows, for giving us peace and rest in the craziness of life. You renew our strength when we feel like we can't go on. You guide us along right paths because you have amazing plans for our lives, plans to prosper us, plans to give us a hope and a future, all so that we can be used by you to bring honor to your name. Even when we walk through the darkest valley, and God, we know we will walk through the darkest of valleys. We will not be afraid because you're close beside us. You're with us. Better than that, you're inside us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is literally inside us at this very moment. So what in the world would we have to fear? Your rod and your staff protect us. Your voice brings comfort and security. You prepare a feast for us in the presence of our enemies. You've got our backs. You honor us by anointing our heads with oil. We are yours. You love us. You bought us at a price. We are your beloved. Our cup overflows with blessings because you are such an incredibly generous and loving God who always knows what we need before we need it. Thank you, God, that your goodness and unfailing love pursues us. Thank you for pursuing us even when you know we're going to wander, even when we think we know better, even when we're stupid. God, thank you for pursuing us all the days of our lives, and we will live in the house of Jehovah Rohi, Lord, our great shepherd forever and ever. Amen.